Thank you for those who were logging into our remote access call. We will be starting momentarily and we thank you for being here with us. All right. All right, we are now streaming live on Facebook. If you'd like to share with your friends, um, we're on Facebook at Access AJC. Thank you all for being here. We are going to start in just a few moments. We're gonna let everyone log in, so thank you. All right, thank you for joining this remote access call. We're going to give everyone one more minute to log in before we begin. <clears throat> All right, Arthur, are you ready to kick us off? Yes. So hello, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. My name is Arthur Rosenblitz and I'm the co-chair of Access Brazil. So thank you very much for joining us with this remote access program. Uh, in the name of the access program is called Challenges to Democracy and Stories of the Jewish Community Resilience in Latin America. As you may know, ACCESS is a young professional division of AJC whose mission is to combat global anti-Semitism, defend Israel's place in the world, and promote democratic values. Israel Brazil was launched almost three years ago, and I was among its first members. We have a fantastic group of young Brazilian Jewish leaders who meet, debate, and advocate in all matters related to Israel and related to the Jewish community. I must tell you that has been a, a tremendous experience, and I can show you there's never a dull moment these days especially. Let me introduce uh, our panelists here, and we have three panelists. I will start to introduce you Adela Smecki from Mexico. Adela has a master's degree in history from the Universidad Anahuaque, Mexico Norte. I hope I got that right, Adela. She has been a high school teacher for the last 10 years, teaching Jewish story with a special focus on the Holocaust. Adela is also an active member of the Jewish community in Mexico where she is the founder and vice president of the Mexican Jewish Youth Federation, as well as a founder and vice president of the Federation of Young Jews for Latin America, and also a board member of the Monte Sinai community. Also here uh, with us, Mariana Salem. Mariana has a degree in political science from the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and is a postgraduate degree in management of nonprofit organizations from the University of Jerusalem. Marketing neuroscience also to complement that. Mariana has worked at AMIA, Asociación Mundial Mutual Israelita Argentina, since 2008. 
She's currently the director of the Department of Members and Development. From Brazil with us, our third panelist, Henny Ozzy Kukier, my friend Henny. Henny is a political scientist, a consultant and a public speaker. In 2018, he ran for the first election and was elected state representative for the Novo Party in the state of Sao Paulo. He studied philosophy and political science in the United States and has a master's degree in conflict resolution from the American University of Washington, D.C. So with all those introductions, I will now give the floor to our very own AGC representative, Muriel Aserraf. Muriel, with you. Thank you so much, Arthur, and hello to everyone. My name is Muriel, and as Arthur just said, I'm AJC and BILA's representative in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where I have the privilege, among a number of other responsibilities, of coordinating our access activities here. So I will use my privilege as moderator um, to ask a few introductory questions to our panelists, and then we will open it for the audience. So please feel free to send your questions in real time using the Q&A box on your screens. Let's start with um, Adela and go to Mexico. Um, Adela, could you tell us a little bit about how the political and economic situation in Mexico were before the crisis, before the COVID crisis, and what has been the sort of controversial response of the government to the crisis? Sure, uh, Muriel, first of all, I want to thank you. Uh, thanks also to the AJC and, and Access for this invitation. Uh, and well, getting back to your question, <clears throat> I, just to give you the context. Uh, in Mexico, we had election, we held election last year. And this really, really new party named Morena uh, took position in December. So this was the first time in, in the whole history of Mexico that we have a a left-leaning government. <clears throat> they are very new in, in, the, in the position. So uh, even before the COVID and even before this crisis, we, we were like watching and, and waiting to see how are they going to lead the, 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 the country and how are they going to go and, and, and take this, uh, this uh, politics. So talking about uh, the, the corona crisis and economical issues, you have to know that in Mexico, the 55% the of the economical populations are car work, cash workers. So they have informal jobs and they don't pay taxes, they don't have social security service. So that's why the government, they, they, they made a lockdown, but it's not a mandatory lockdown. You know, uh, all the schools, all the shopping malls, the factories, restaurants, and all the not essential business and services are closed. But uh, it's not that if you go out of your house, uh, uh, they're going to arrest you or they're, they're going to give you a ticket for that. Uh, uh, most of the, the people, of most of the population needs to go out every day to, to work, to, to earn the, the daily food, you know. So that's really um, a really controversial situation because most of the people, most of these people are in a not in not the best economical situation, so they don't even have the the money to buy, you know, face mask or any any kind of uh, protection for them. Thank you very much, uh, Marian. Could you tell us a little bit about the political situation in Argentina? Um, I know that you had elections a few months ago. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the political platforms that the new government had run on before the COVID-19 um, crisis hit. Okay, we thank you for this meeting today, uh, first of all. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And going to your uh, question, uh, I have to start since 2001. Argentina at that time was under a very, very hard economical and social crisis. So uh, came a left party uh, to uh, make the government of this uh, period of 12 years where Argentina started to become a, a more um, affordable country. So during these years, what happened here in the last, since 2002, 
2015, the Argentina's country could rebuild in some way, okay? But a lot of people started to um, carry about the inflation of our country and the economic uh, crisis that came till 2015, when we had another election, uh, 10 Argentinian people to vote to the right uh, party that was on the government since 2015 till 2019. This left a, a right government tried to solve this economic crisis in some way, uh, and uh, it uh, had a new external debt, something that is very, very hard to afford these days. So when this uh, government uh, came to the end, the elections uh, came in, in, the, in a way that people uh, vote to the left party again. So we are under a left government since uh, the end of 2019 till these days. This new government uh, had the intention to increase the um, state, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to increase the expenditures, thank you, of, of the state uh, in, in order to uh, make our uh, economy uh, be better. But uh, suddenly this pandemic came to us. So, uh, well, the plan of, uh, of, of how to reconvert the economic situation in Argentina, it's like stopped right now, okay? So the, the pandemic uh, brought us a, a new scenario uh, where we have to carry about the health uh, uh, travel these days. So we are living, we were living under a very hard uh, political crack between two parties and, and the society very, very divided between these two uh, uh, parties or, or uh, economic um, uh, visions. And these days we have like a, a collaboration um, atmosphere here between these two parties. But the economic situation is going worse. It's our, our context is uh, very similar, like Adele uh, told us before. A lot of people here has informal jobs. So, uh, and, and the little and middle enterprises are going into cracks uh, because of the quarantine. Here in Argentina, the quarantine is mandatory, so no one can go out their their homes, and a lot of people is losing are are losing their jobs, uh, or the enterprises are closing. Uh, even when the state has different uh, programs to solve this situation, well, it's very very hard these days in terms of the economic uh, context here in Argentina. Adding the issue of the external debt that at the end of May, we have to take some decisions in order how, how Argentina will be uh, in front of the in external uh, market and, and, and the world uh, are all around us in, in the context which in the international uh, scenarios is also very, very hard. Thank you very much, Mariana. Um, Henny, uh, in Brazil, the current government was elected on a promise of change for Brazil. After years of ruling by the left-wing party PT, the Partido dos Trabalhadores, the Workers' Party, we could say. Has the government been able to deliver on that promise, at least until COVID-19 hit the country? All right, so I will first, uh, I would like to thank you, AJC, for this opportunity. And uh, I want to greet all my colleagues, especially you, Muriel, and Artur. Uh, me and Muriel, we worked together at AJC uh, some time ago. And it was a pleasure uh, to meet her again here in Brazil. Um, all right, so, I mean, we have to remember the context, right, Muriel? And one thing that uh, uh, people forget, the country became very polarized because of the election. There were no real alternatives to beat PT. 
which was the former leftist body that was involved in such a huge, some people say is the world's largest uh, corruption scandal in the democratic world. Uh, out of that context, uh, Bolsonaro became elected. He was, uh, he sell himself as an outsider, but in reality, he has been a legislator for more than two decades. So he was a well-known figure, not very um, important um, and without any major accomplishments in, a, in his uh, job as a legislator. But he got elected, he, he had a very strong um, opposition towards uh, PT and everything that happened in the country in the past 14 years. So uh, that was the appeal for his election. Uh, a lot of people didn't have him as the first choice, but they understood that we could not continue, especially after everything we saw, the arrest of uh, the former president, Lula, and many other things in the country, PT, PT to continue to be ruling. So uh, a lot of people say, okay, but he has good ministries and he he is surrounded himself with some uh, very qualified people. One of them was the famous uh, judge uh, of Lava Jato, uh, the scandal corruption uh, operation. And uh, Moro became his Ministry of Justice and was one of the main uh, pillars of his administration. So on one side, you had Moro as the guardian of uh, ethics, morality, and a new fight against uh, corruption and security, which is a big issue for Brazil. And on the other side, you have Gadges, which is the, uh, the guru for the economy, is a liberal, he, he pr uh, promised a different path for Brazil. And you have those two uh, segments uh, working. Uh, Bolsonaro did not have a good way of uh, negotiating and approaching Congress. So he didn't, he didn't cope well with the legislative power and that didn't help him to advance many of his proposals during this first year. Uh, but we were successful in bringing a, a pension reform to the country. That was not so much his uh, accomplishment or his success, Bolsonaro, but was uh, a general or, I mean, I would say like a Congress acted uh, and that was good and it brings some uh, perspective for, for the economy, you know, like the economy was starting to taking off again. Some reforms were promised, uh, a new president with a different agenda on the economy and all of that, it seems that it was taking the country in the right direction. You know, a lot of good results we are seeing on the economic side. But on the other side, Bolsonaro is a very controversial figure. And he started to get into arguments, lots of problems with his, uh, his sons. Uh, they are also politicians and their stories, scandals, investigations. All of that is, was compromising his credibility. More and more, he was becoming a populist, uh, using the populist ideology to maintain his support, becoming more, um, I would say, uh, not radical, but uh, more, um, he was just communicating for his crowd, his core, his uh, strongest base. And that was alienating a lot of people and alienating a lot of uh, possible allies in a democracy. You have to talk to everyone. He was not doing that. And it, this situation got worse and worse by the days, by the months, you know, and, uh, but the economy was doing fine. And then we got uh, coronavirus and that changed everything. And in the middle of that, he started to, to be one of the only leaders in the world that uh, was against any possible uh, form of isolation or quarantine. Even Trump and Netanyahu that are more to the right they, they back away or they back, they back off, you know, they, they change their, uh, their arguments and they started to accept uh, social distancing or some type of quarantines. But uh, Bolsonaro didn't do that. And in the middle of that uh, problem, he, he had a, uh, a fight with the Moro, which was one of those pillars that sustained his government. And Moro left the government uh, attacking Bolsonaro, saying that he wanted to intervene in the federal police 
to prevent further investigation against uh, their son, his sons. So bottom line is Bolsonaro is becoming more and more isolated, uh, but the people that uh, defend or the, the, his base, they're very uh, vocal and they still amounts to around 20%. Nowadays, we've been talking about impeachment. Uh, that's the scenario. The economy is doing really bad. The, uh, the real, our currency, is the worst in terms of the valuation uh, against the dollar compared to, I guess, any other currency around the world. Um, I mean, we have a lot of uh, a very informal economy. The people are suffering because they, they are not allowed to work or they can't work because of the virus. So there is a big discussion and dilemma in Brazil how to handle uh, the health issue caused by the virus versus the economy side, the economic side, which in Brazil becomes even more uh, problematic given the this social conditions. So I guess uh, nowadays there is a lot of political instability. We are living uh, the worst health crisis as most of the world, uh, the economic crisis as well. On the top, on top of that, we have a political crisis that at some times we hear more about the political crisis nowadays uh, in the news outlet than we hear about coronavirus. So to give you an idea for the people that are listening to us, everyone that turns on the TV everywhere around the world, the only thing you hear are news on coronavirus. That's not the true anymore in Brazil. And that gives you a dimension of what is going on. Politically, the situation is very unstable. A lot of people talking about impeachment. I don't think that's possible for now, but uh, there is like a, there is so much going on on that side. Moro is fighting against Bolsonaro. And that's a big shift and change in the political landscape here. I guess pretty much Thank that's you, kind of the summary, right? Thank you very much. Um, I want to go back to, um, Mar to, sorry, to Adela in Mexico. Um, Adela, could you just tell us a little bit more in detail how the situation has been um, in terms of how the response has been of the population to the measures adopted by the president? You, you, you mentioned it briefly, but maybe you could tell us if, um, you know, if, if this has somehow affected also the popularity of the president. So that would be my first question. And I think we also all want to know a little bit more about the Jewish community in Mexico. I know that there is um, beautiful stories of the Jewish community uh, coming out very early on to respond to the epidemic and, and implementing some really, um, really strict measures of isolation and that these have been applauded quite um, generally by the public, by the general public. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. Sure. Well, talking about the the, people, the popularity of the of the president, uh, when he was elected, he was uh, for sure he was the most popular president we ever have. Uh, the people just love him. Um, so this is the first time that we have uh, a, a really a really strong image uh, from from one president in, in Mexico. And of course, that this this situation of, uh, about the, the Corona crisis and the way that they are handle the situation, it has made him lose some followers, but not in a really big or very important number. He's still very, very popular in the country. Uh, there's, talking about opposition, you have to know that uh, in the government, there's almost no opposition uh, against the, the president. Uh, and in the private sector, and talking about intellectual and journalist, journal people, and also to talk about the, um, businessmen, opinion leaders, they are against him. There are some people that, that are against him, but this private sector is not well organized. So again, uh, he has some opposition, not in the, in the government, but in the, in the public, in the private sector, but it's not uh, really, really important uh, or, be, or really um, uh, uh, with a lot of weight. So talking about the Jewish community, uh, yes, it's amazing all the work that the Jewish community has done. And I want to split all the efforts of the Jewish community in two big, big parts. In one hand, we have uh, the inside community efforts. So the Jewish community, they, they um, I mean, 
uh, coordinated by the Central Committee team, they ordered the lockdown many weeks before the government ordered us. So all the synagogues, all the schools, all, all the community centers and the sports centers uh, that belong to the Jewish community, they closed even before that the, the government ordered us. Uh, they create, I, I name it like a damage control system, okay? So in that way, they, they, they want to protect all the Jewish members, all the Jews of, of the uh, of members of the Jewish community, and they create new channels of communication. Uh, in, and in that channels, they share important information, uh, recommendation given by the, by the doctors. Uh, they have a new web page, uh, you know, Facebook pages, Instagram, and also WhatsApp um, uh, distribution uh, information channels. Uh, they, they, they have like specific um, channels to, to share all the numbers of Jewish people that are infected, all the community members that are infected of coronavirus, also the number of people that are recovered by this uh, uh, virus, and well, unfortunately, the, the people that, who die. Uh, they constantly send out recommendations. That's very, very important. And if, if there's a person that have uh, this virus, they, they started to send you know, all the information that they need to know in order to keep safe the other members of the family who lives with them. And you know, uh, uh, there are some, some doctors, there are some kind of uh, board of voluntary doctors uh, who speak with this patient, who, who speak with this, uh, uh, to the people that are infected. And they talk about the symptoms and they give also guidelines and recommendations uh, when they have to go to the hospital or what kind of medicine they can take or they can't take uh, in order to recover uh, most efficiently for, from this virus. So nowadays, even that uh, we are not uh, we are not ended the lockdown in, in, in Mexico, we know now that uh, the reopen of the Jewish community institution will, will come weeks after that the government allowed us just to make sure that we are, that we're okay and it's very safe to, to go out of our house. And in, a, in other hand, I want to, to talk about all the, all the measures and the support that the Jewish community has gave to the, to the government and also to the Mexican people. Uh, there are many donations that the Jewish community has done uh, to many different kind of organizations, you know. Uh, for example, I want to share that uh, there are food or medica, medical equipment given to, to doctors or public hospitals. Uh, also clothes to homeless people, you know, it's, it's something uh, common here in Mexico. Uh, they have donated tons and tons of food to different mayors uh, so they can distribute uh, this food to, to the poor people and the people who need it the most. In each um, in each community, uh, also they have donated thousands and thousands of face masks uh, to the Mexican populations that are that, that that have to use the subway or they are just walking in the streets or they have to go out to 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 work, you know. So they don't have enough um, enough equipment, and the community has donated. And also uh, this is um, and this also. The, tell us a little bit more about the, the situation in Mexico. One of the, the main things that the community has donated is cell phones, okay? So I'm sure that you are asking why they donate cell phones or who needs cell phones right now, you know? So in Mexico, you have to know that in the public hospitals, they don't have a, the, the efficient system of communication. They don't have a phones in, in the rooms of the patients or even Sometimes they don't have phones uh, in, in the floor of the whole hospital. So when somebody gets into the hospital because of this coronavirus, the relatives can, can't go inside the hospital. And they, they, they pass some days and they don't have any communication either with the patient or with the doctor. They don't know anything about the situation of their the relative, the, the mother, the father. So this is really, really struggle situation. They. Um, uh, uh, so the community has donated uh, hundreds of cell phones to this, these patients, of course, the people that are, are not in intensive care. Uh, so they can call to the relatives and say, hello, I'm okay. They take care of me. I'm alive. You know, uh, the things is going well. 
So this this has been some of the, the things that uh, the Jewish community has done, either to inside the community to take care of us, to 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 share with us update information because it's something relevant, something that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, talking about the challenge that has a public health system in Mexico, um, they don't have, you know, like um, they have official numbers of of people who are sick or the people who passed away because of the of the virus, but the, these numbers are not real numbers. Okay, and the government knows this, and they they share with us this this situation. So just to just to mention a, a, a little bit a, about this situation, a, at the beginning of the crisis, the government came together and said, okay, we have to 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 have a a plan of action. What's going to happen with this crisis in Mexico? Uh, talking about health and and, and public care uh, system. So uh, they they get they they divided all the all the crisis in three stages, uh, and during the second stage, just to, to give you an example, in the second stage, uh, the um, sub, the yeah the subdirector of the of the um, of the office of public health in Mexico, he was sharing with us that all the numbers, the official numbers that they gave us, we have to multiply by eight. It was a, a model, a mathematical model named Sentinel. So I they think, say, okay. Yeah, I think we've, so, we, we see this problem in a lot of different countries um, in Latin America, but I wanna, sorry, please, please finish. <laughs> no, it's okay. So, uh, because in Mexico, uh, they didn't have the, well, we don't have the resources of, uh, of buying enough tests to know how many people is infected or not. They are using mathematical models, you know, in order to try to understand uh, how is this virus uh, moving from one, from one place to another and from one stage to another. Thank you, Adela. I think this is um, quite uplifting in the midst of all the bad news to hear about um, uh, this inspiring story of how the Mexican Jewish community uh, really stood strong and has inspired um, and been, and been uh, applauded by the general public. Uh, Mariana, would you also tell us a little bit about the Jewish community, the Jewish community in Argentina, which is one of the most, one of the biggest ones in Latin America? What has the response been? Has there been any um, events of anti-Semitism uh, or anything like that, uh, which I hope there haven't, but um, could, you, could you give us a, 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 an idea of the landscape? Okay, uh, well, yeah, in Argentina, uh, the opposite of what Adele told us, um, first of all, Argentina is the sixth or seventh commu largest community of Jewish people in, in the world. So uh, we are a lot of Jewish people in, in Argentina. I work for AMIA, which is like the umbrella institution for, for the Jewish uh, community and, and leading the Jewish organizations. Uh, in our country. So um, the, this crisis came very, very um, rapidly to us. We were not prepared for all what we had to do. Um, the quarantine began be, begin, uh, before we were uh, preparated to this. So uh, all our work uh, in terms of the COVID crisis came after the lockdown. So we had to learn how to continue on uh, working uh, like virtually and bringing all uh, our services and, and activities uh, like in, in this virtual way. Uh, and we found two kind of um, uh, situations. First of all, Argentina's Jewish community is almost composed by a uh, middle class people who are like independent workers. So this quarantine, this lockdown brought us uh, to a very hard uh, crisis in terms of uh, how, how is the, the way of life of, of the people, right? Uh, for example, uh, JCCs close from a day to another and people cannot afford the expenses of JCCs. Uh, Jewish schools 
went on lockdown from a day to another, and uh, fathers and families cannot afford the expenses of the Jewish schools. So we are trying to um, work in a, an individual level, like helping families, helping people who is alone and would not have any kind of help uh, but AMIA's help, AMIA, what AMIA brings to them. And in another way, we have to uh, work and help institutions, which is very, very difficult to, to, to do because institutions are autonomous. So we are trying to help them how to continue on their own activities, but they need the help of the community. The, the same community that cannot afford the expenses of belonging to. So we are like a, a living on a dilemma here in, in the community of Argentina, knowing that uh, we have the know-how to uh, try to go uh, continue on. So the crisis of the 2001 uh, uh, gave us a, a sad but a hard experience on how to handle these kind of uh, situations. So we are uh, working, uh, having the, um, the, the idea of that working together uh, people and organizations is the only way we can go um, on our feet again. Um, the relation of the Jewish community with the uh, society, in the general society, is, is wealthy. My perspective is that we are living like a very, very well as, as Jewish people in, in this country. And we are also called to help other collectives uh, to find uh, solutions in this kind of crisis. For example, the government uh, uh, tries to, to call us uh, to make advice on how, how's the best way to help people these days. Uh, collectives of enterprises also know, uh, want to know uh, what they can do uh, and, and we br bring our know-how in this kind of uh, uh, processes to, to carry off this situation in general. And um, every day we are in different newspapers uh, bringing uh, advice on how to work with elderly people, how to work with children and how uh, the volunteering is a very, very special activity that anyone can develop in order to help others. So uh, we feel that bringing advice is, is also a good uh, way to help our society and to keep on building our, no, our good name as Jewish people in, in this country, yes? Uh, I think, well, um, we are having very, very tough times as Jewish people in Argentina, uh, but um, our place in the society uh, also leads us to think that we can help in this of uh, rebuild uh, this, uh, this society again after this crisis. And, right. and we are very glad of, of, of having this place, right? Wonderful. Uh, I'm so glad. This is, this, is, this is great to hear. I want to turn to Henny um, to hear also a little bit about the Jewish community in Brazil. Very briefly, the response. Um, uh, Brazilian Jewish community is also a very strong, um, prominent uh, community. And I also want, Henny, if you could, your, your yourself a politician and you're also a, a member of the Jewish community. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the recent anti-Semitic, anti anti-Zionist, Nazi references uh, that have been made by some members of the current government, either in social media or in videos and stuff like that? And how has this impacted the relationship of this government with the Jewish community? Yeah, now we can hear. You've been seeing, uh, we've been seeing here uh, some uh, 
a few episodes that uh, brings tension and some of them they are uh, in nature uh, anti-Semitic uh, episodes done by the government uh, not by Bolsonaro itself but by other members of the government and and that has caused obviously a lot of uh, criticism from the Jewish community and from other uh, other entities or players in general. I will, I'll tell you a little bit about each one of the, the episodes because they are different. There was one time that the Secretary of Culture, uh, he presented himself and uh, imitating or, or like Gebos and then in the whole setup of the scenario and everything in the way he presented his, himself in a video uh, or something like that. And uh, that was very shocking for everyone. The other uh, story that was has caused some problems lately or recently, there are protests or not protests, but there are manifestations of support towards Bolsonaro and they are carrying uh, flags of Israel together. And that is becoming an issue because Bolsonaro, the more he becomes a more polarizing figure associated with mistakes and statements and uh, positions that are less humane or less concerned with uh, uh, the pandemic or stuff like that. So it becomes a, a serious issue for the Jewish community to be uh, related to that or Israel to be associated with that. So that, that is another issue. Also, there is the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he compared the, the campaign hospitals with uh, concentration camps hospitals. So there's, there, are, there are several comments on, along those lines. The last one was this idea uh, that was um, the copy or and this one particularly, I don't think was done on purpose, was a mistake. The other ones are more questionable. I think they are, they are more associated. They see some value. They like some of those uh, populist, more totalitarian or authoritarian ideas associated with Nazism. Uh, but this one, the last one that I, I, I was about to describe is this, uh, like war, works, uh, of, uh, what was the saying? You, you helped me with that, Morel. It's like the working uh, frees people. The same saying that we have in, the, uh, in Auschwitz. Yes, in the Ahbeth might spread. He said he used the, the words that Im kind of implied that work would free the Brazilian people, yeah. labor yeah. would free the Brazilian people. Yeah, they used the same phrases, particularly on that one, I think was a, they didn't pay attention, but given all the other instances or all the other situations it didn't it didn't came lightly you know it wasn't uh, seen as a good uh, sign so there's a lot of that uh, going on and that is creating tension between the community and uh, Bolsonaro but at the same time there was a lot of uh, there's a big part of the Jewish community in Brazil that support Bolsonaro I don't know if it's a big part but there was an anti PT sentiment uh, among the Jewish community. And we could see that uh, in the way during the election and afterwards, I think it was more of that. There are some people that they are really close to Bolsonaro. There are some uh, Jewish leaders of the community. Uh, they are really, really friends with Bolsonaro. And that creates a little bit of tension inside the community and also outside. Uh, I think the, the government uh, is following the same tracks as Trump, you know, at the same time that he wants to be close to Israel uh, politically in foreign policy issues and admire Israel because of the, uh, the evangelical votes in Brazil. He also has this, uh, this flavor of uh, fasc fascism which connects with Nazism and populism in many ways. And we see instances of that that contradicts the idea of being close to Israel. And, 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 and that, that dilemma or that, uh, that dynamic also prevents a lot of uh, Jews here to be very critical of him because for the first time, 
uh, Brazil is defending Israel and that we have to, to, I mean, applaud that, you know, we have to agree that uh, it's amazing to see a big country like Brazil uh, joining Israel and being close to Israel on almost every other issue all the time and conditionally in the same way the United States has been with Israel, Brazil now is on that side. Good friend. So, and which is a good note. I mean, we can't disregard. I don't like that idea, and that's more of my public, uh, my my personal opinion. I don't like that idea to compare Bolsonaro's government, given all the mistakes and all the problems, with a fast fascist or Nazist uh, ideology support government. You know, mm -hmm. they, they they have those those. Uh, those glitches, I would say, you know, in their ideology, their thinking, uh, which are serious, and we have to be very uh, outspoken against that. But at the same time, we, we couldn't go that far to the other extreme to classify them as something that they are not, you know. Of so course. that would be the idea on the Jewish community. You asked me something about the, uh, what was it, about my position as a politician? No, you, I just wanted to make sure people knew where you were coming from as you spoke about this. So I, um, but I want, I see the clock is running and I want to make sure we have a few more minutes. I'm going to ask a question that's a combination, a combination of a few questions that have been asked by the audience before and during, during this call. Um, but if you could, you're all, you're, you know, you're young three Jewish leaders in your own respect, each in your own way. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about sort of, what is the what are what what are um, what are the greater opportunities for young Jews in your countries um, to be involved, and how does this speak to to specifically to the resiliency of the Jewish community in Latin America? I think seeing young faces is already a testimony of how strong and vibrant these communities are. But I wonder if you could, in very few minutes each, because unfortunately we don't have that much more time, speak a little bit about that. Um, thinking about our specific audience who are, you know, our young access leaders from around the world and a lot from, from the United States. Mariana. Yeah, I think the best young leaders can do is involved by doing. Our experience last days is that uh, a lot, a lot of young people, I say even a thousand of them, were uh, involved in um, accompanying elderly people by just making calls and going to uh, see if they need something because elderly people cannot go outside their homes. So uh, they are like building their leadership by doing, not by uh, studying, not by uh, being milit militations in, in some party, just doing. So I think they are um, getting a very important movement in Argentina uh, around just doing what is needed in the community. Uh, this is my advice based on the experience I am seeing these days here. They are just asking everywhere uh, what, what can they do. Just this uh, question uh, uh, is um, is doing a lot because they are like uh, um, uh, uh, it's very very beautiful seeing them doing this. Thank you, Adela. So, sure. Uh, talking about in Mexico, what's happening with the young people here in my country? Well, because we cannot go outside of of our houses. Uh, we we uh, became all our all of our life into a virtual life okay so nowadays we have so many activities that, that uh, all they are offering all the people you know mostly the young but all the people are are offering offering also you know community leaders rabbis every, everybody's uh, offering things in Facebook, Instagram, Zoom lessons, etc. And talking about the, the young movements in Mexico, uh, we, nowadays we have uh, cooking lessons and dance lessons and, you know, some political 
uh, activities also uh, uh, they have like a lesson well like a lecture with the Israeli ambas ambassador in Mexico also we have social meetings you know where uh, they they invite us to to listen some jokes you know and also entrepreneurship because nowadays that we know that the economical situation is going to be not only in the community also in the country it's going to be really 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 bad after the the corona crisis and nowadays we need the most uh, entrepreneurship and and businessmen who who knows how to uh, turn turn around the situation so um so get involved and uh, my my advice to all these people all the to these young leaders get involved with the resources that you have if you can go outside your houses, then do it. But if you can't do it, do it inside and use the, the internet, you know? Thank you. Henny. Yes, I think uh, it's very important to, uh, to change our countries. Uh, it's necessary to have new people inside uh, positions of leadership. From my perspective, I would obviously emphasize the role of politicians. We need uh, new faces. We need new people interested in that. Part of my, my job or my mission is not only uh, being an example, but uh, I try to, to bring younger people closer to politics. And uh, all, all my team that works with me, you are my former students. Uh, they believe in Brazil and they like uh, and they want to help. And I, I, I would love to see more, uh, even Jewish uh, leaders coming out to get involved into politics. I've been talking to a lot of people inside the Jewish community to create a program to, to, to form these new leaders into politics, Jewish leaders. There are very few Jews into politics. Uh, some people say I'm the only uh, legislator in the country. We know that uh, there are all, uh, some others from other states, but definitely uh -huh. this state from my state, which is Sao Paulo, it's uh, the largest state. And uh, I think it's of uh, great importance to have more young people involved into politics. If we want to change anything, we need uh, fresh ideas. We need uh, new ways of doing things. We need commitment and uh, to, to the country, to the nation, you know, and the young people are, are, are key in this process. So I would like to see more uh, young people inside politics and even better if they were uh, from the Jewish community. Great, thank you so much, Hani. Um, I think we've come to the end of this discussion, this uh, very interesting discussion, and I wanna thank our wonderful speakers for joining us. I think this was a, a global, at least a regional panel, if there ever was one. And I think this is what Access Global is all about. This is about building bridges and learning um, with young Jews from all over the world. So thank you for, for doing what you're doing. Thank you for being so inspiring. Uh, personally, I'm thrilled that our Access Brazil chapter um, is a leader in that sense and that we're doing um, the work that we're doing in Latin America. Um, I want to also let you know that there's a, a lot more coming from Access and AJC in virtual programming. So please visit our website, www.ajc.org. Thank you again for joining us today. Please stay safe and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Muriel. Thank, Thank you, you to the AJC. Thank you so Thank much you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Take much. care. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye.